All right, welcome everyone. Um, we are returning from our 5.30 closed session, and we're gonna begin our regular meeting for the Capitola City Council. And we've already done roll call, so please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, Okay. Is my mic on? Can you hear me? They're on. It's, yeah. It's low, right? It, it is, yes. Can you hear me now? It, it's tracking the sound. Okay. So when Jamie gets here, I'm sure he'll fix okay. it. Okay. Um, any, so we'll move on to item two. Any additions or deletions to the agenda? Staff has no changes to tonight's agenda. Okay. Everyone, you can tell I am not our usual mayor. Brown. I'm sitting in for our mayor who's returning from D.C. this evening. Um, I'm going to wait for our attorney to come back on a report from our closed session. Hi, good evening. A closed session was had and no reportable action was taken. Great. We'll move on to item four for additional materials. Do we have any additional materials? One public comment was received for the closed session item, and it was published with the agenda packet online. It was provided to the city council in advance of the closed session. Okay, thanks. Um, can our city manager turn the mics up just a little bit? Thank you. Okay, we'll bring, um, this moves us to item five, oral communications by members of the public. This is your opportunity to address city council on items not on this evening's agenda um, and or items that are on our consent items. Good evening. Welcome. Dear mayor, council members, and Katie, I'm standing here not to ask for something or to complain. I'm here to thank you out of the bottom of my heart for all you have done for us over the years. With my late husband, you helped us to get the rent ordinance back. When I took over his position as president of the HOA, I noticed that some residents in the park were paying too much in rent. The rent control ordinance is for everybody. You and Caitlin Hurley helped me with this task, and Fiera Enterprises corrected their mistake. Thank you so much, Katie. Dear Mayor and Council Members, thank you again on behalf of all the residents of Cabrillo Mobile Home Estate for all you have done to make this park affordable for everyone. With utmost regard, Charlotte. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, welcome. Um, first of all, I was looking at your consent agenda items and surprised that on the consent is City of Capitola military equipment use. I would like to see that pulled for the regular agenda. That needs serious discussion, in my opinion. Um, Many people were compelled to get uh, COVID shots. In fact, I know some of your employees who didn't want it, who um, felt compelled or lose their job. So this is related. It's called the graphene age, and it tells something that's in these shots. Graphene oxide is a compound of carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen in variable ratios which can be formed into ultra-thin layers about one nanometer thick. Graphene's high conductivity and flexibility make it the linchpin of 5G wireless technology, as it is a super absorber of microwaves. Graphene oxide transistors are in every 5G transmission device. The optimal signal multiplication frequency for graphene transistors is 26 gigahertz the very frequency that the Federal Communications Commission is currently auctioning off. Wi-Fi microwave frequency bands range from 2.4 to 5 gigahertz. Frequencies in the 5G range operate at more potent power densities than those in the 4G range. They're all damaging, by the way. A recent paper in Annals of Case Reports by EMF 
researcher Dr. Leonard Hardell indicates that exposure to the high frequencies and power density of 5G results in a host of neurological symptoms such as tinnitus, fatigue, insomnia, emotional distress, skin disorders, and blood pressure variability. Moreover, the high energy consumed by 5G cells is discharged into the air, exposing plants, animals, and humans to unprecedented levels of electricity. But there's more. Researchers, and I'll give you copies, in both Spain and the UK have found graphene oxide in the COVID vaccines and have observed strange transistor-like structures in the blood of COVID vaccine individuals, raising the possibility that 5G frequencies can communicate with the graphene oxide structures in the blood. Moreover, a 2020 study in Talanta found that graphene oxide nanoparticles showed excellent selective sensing ability towards adrenaline and tyrosine related to these young athletes falling over while performing. Thank you. Any other members of our public who would like to address council? Good evening. Good evening. My name is Goran Klopic. I play basketball almost every day at J Street Park and uh, I'm a frequent user of the Capitola Public Library. I want to draw attention to something of what is happening at Capitola J Street Park uh, sometimes. I see activity of uh, drug sales happening there, and there are little kids who are playing there in the kindergarten. And I called two times also uh, the uh, CPD because there were gang signs uh, uh, and uh, they are uh, sometimes arguing with me that's graffiti. Uh, it's not graffiti. Graffiti is something beautiful. Uh, I know from my uh, police work in Europe what the graffiti is. <coughs> uh, uh, when gang gangs paint something, they paint it in an ugly uh, space to uh, mark their territory. And uh, that's what I have been only uh, complaining about. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Goodbye. Thank you. Anyone else who would like to address council? Hi. Welcome. Hi. Uh, my name is Kevin Norton. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you. I'm grateful for this opportunity. I'm here to talk about assorted attacks. Um, I'm not the greatest public speaker, but I'm motivated by all the people in hospitals right now who are there unnecessarily, uh, many of which, or most of whom, uh, suffer from chronic conditions, which are largely preventable, as attested to by the CDC and the World Health Organiza Organization. Um, <clears throat> when I worked at a hospital before I got into public health, I saw many of the conditions that soda is associated with, such as cancer, type 2 diabetes, heart disease, dental decay, and more. It's really not a matter of education. Uh, the soda industry does more than enough education in the form of advertising. We've seen so many images of um, beautiful people having fun on TV during the course of our lifetime that we think that these are harmless beverages. Um, but in fact, they're not. Uh, did you know that um, more than half of American Latinos are predicted to um, develop type 2 diabetes in this generation. <clears throat> and uh, sugar has been shown that it, it may be addictive. Um, I also invite you to find out why uh, high fructose corn syrup is added to soda and so many other uh, ultra processed foods. Um, <clears throat> and the soda industry uses the tobacco playbook in order to confuse the public and continue to sell their harmful products for as long as possible. But make no mistake that someday uh, sugar-sweetened beverages will be looked at like cigarettes. Um, so the obstacles to a soda tax are now gone thanks to a lawsuit that was co-led by Martine Watkins, a city council member in Santa Cruz. They may pass a soda tax next month regardless of what they do. Wouldn't it be great if we had a soda tax here in Capitola? Uh, many 
important investments could be made, such as health education, parks, bikes, uh, bike and, and walking paths, and so on. Uh, if you proceed with um, passing a soda tax, I'm willing to knock on doors, find volunteers, make phone calls to make sure that you succeed. And I think that uh, people are well educated enough here for it to pass, and it wouldn't hurt to put it up to voters and let them decide. Thank you, and uh, take good care of yourselves. Thank you. Anyone else from the audience? Okay, so this is going to move us to item six, uh, staff comments. I don't think I have any comments other than just kudos to the police department for a great skate tola event last weekend at McGregor Park. Thank you. Um, any council comments? Down here. I would like to echo the city manager. Uh, it was nice to see the chief out there with all the kids. Um, they had a great time and uh, just, just great to see the city, especially the police department doing something like this for our youth. I was not able to attend, but I heard it was great. And also, um, it's my second meeting, shouting out Public Works. But we're closing the lagoon, and that means summer is coming, and it's Memorial Day weekend. So everybody come out and watch them. They're pros at it, and it's actually kind of fun to watch them do it. So just a little shout-out to them, and um, everybody be safe this, this long weekend. Thanks. Um, okay, just a few comments. Um, I had the opportunity to attend the Santa Cruz County Business Chamber event with um, Speaker Rivas, who gave us an update on the uh, state budget with a $27 million, um, $27 billion deficit. Um, and he notified us that cuts will be in regards to homelessness um, projects and housing and mental health programs. So I just wanted to make council aware of that. Um, I'm also the vice president for the Monterey League of Cities who also echoed the same um, the same issues uh, and really went into depth on that. I'll be sharing with uh, staff the one page write up that I'll go ahead and send out to the rest of you. I also just recently um, resigned my three year seat as the chair for the Children's Network. As you all know, I sit on behalf of the city of Capitola. So I'll still be in on the the commission, but I'm no longer serving as chair. It was a very long three years, um, so but it's a great organization. Um, and then finally, I um, have been invited by Ecology Action to attend um, the uh, bike study program as a delegate for um, the county, and I'll be going to the Netherlands June 3rd second to the seventh um they wrote a grant and i received funding to attend that so i'm going to go learn about bikes and infrastructure in the netherlands <laughs> so wish me luck um not paid by the city paid by the grant um, itself so i'll bring back some information on that um finally to staff um if i believe just we had a comment about the sugar beverage tax and can you just quickly comment i believe our city is not eligible to do something like that and if you could just be in a I, if you know the answer, let us know. But if not, a Friday update would be. I think I know the answer, but I'm not sure. So I prefer <clears throat> checking checking the facts. And I can just give you a quick little update offline. Great. Thank you. Okay. No, that's all my comments. Yeah, I just I wanted to second the interest in the soda tax. If that's possible, that is something that I um, brought up previously and was I was unaware of these um, changes. I, I'm talking pretty loud. I think yeah. the mics are super very low. Very low. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, but yeah, I'd be very interested in seeing if we could do something like that. So just wanted to add that. Great. Thank I'll, you. I'll double check and let the council know. Okay. Shall we just wait for you to adjust them? Can the audience hear us? No? Yes? Huh? No? <laughs> Maybe? Louder. All the way in the back. All the way in the back. Hello. Test, test, test. Low. Testing. Testing. I don't think it changed. It didn't change. Testing. You're an echo. Hello. No. I know that's what I'm thinking. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. 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 I don't, I don't hear anything. All right. We'll let Jamie mess around with that. We'll speak up a little bit. This is going to move us to item seven. This is consent items seven A through H. Um, 
unless a council member would like to pull any of the items, I would ask for a motion. I move we uh, make a motion for consent items A through H. We have a first. A second. Okay, we have a first and a second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? That item passes unanimously. The mics I are now on? We're not on. Okay. okay. Are they? So for our oh. online viewers, we... Oh. Hi. Wow. Beautiful. Okay. Let me... Oh. Can we turn down the mic? <laughs> <laughs> not karaoke. I turned every volume button I could find. That no, it's all right. It was off. Okay. All right. Okay. Maybe. Maybe a little bit lower. That sounds perfect. I can hear myself so loud. Um, for our online viewers, yes, our mouths were moving because our meeting did start a little late um, after 6 o'clock. We did move through roll call, Pledge of Allegiance. We had no reportable actions on closed session. Um, we had a several additional materials that were submitted and are available online for viewing. We had several oral communications, a few comments from staff, talking about Skate Tola and some council comments. Um, so we're now, we also had item 7A through H approved by council. So we're gonna be moving on to general government at this time. Thank you for your patience, audience. Okay, so we're gonna move on to item 8A, COE bylaws and uh, fiscal year 23-25 goals. Um, I'll turn this over. Good evening, Council. Uh, my name is Erica Senek, and I'm the Environmental Projects Manager for the City of Capitola, as well as the staff liaison for the Commission on the Environment. Um, at the April 11th, 2024 City Council meeting, the CUE bylaws and goals for fiscal year 24-25 was included as an item on the consent agenda. This item was pulled from the consent agenda and Vice Mayor Brooks requested that the COE bring additional background information on the proposed goals to City Council at a future meeting. So we have two commissioners here today to speak on behalf of those proposed goals for you. Uh, next slide. Oh, thanks. Um, but first, I just wanted to provide a bit of information about the proposed revisions to the bylaws. On January 13th, 2005, City Council adopted Resolution 3424 to establish the COE and adopted initial bylaws. Regular review of bylaws is considered a best practice for ensuring that the bylaws accurately represent the Commission. At the February 21st, 2024 COE meeting, the Commission passed a motion to submit revised bylaws for City Council adoption. The COE recommends that adding the highlighted text that you see on the slide before you to section two of the bylaws, so that the bylaws read now as follows. The purpose of the COE is to provide advice and recommendations to the city council on policy and funding matters relating to sustainability, environmental protection, climate action plan implementation, and resource enhancement, which benefits the city of Capitola and which are not under the jurisdictions of existing committees or commissions. In fiscal year 23-24, the COE completed two primary projects, the first of which was the Environmentally Sensitive Habitat Area, or ESHA, Riparian Vegetation Planting Reimbursement Program. This program offered $300 rebates to eligible parcels for planting native riparian vegetation along Soquel Creek and Noble Gulch. The program will be concluding on July 1st, 2024. It was supported by using green building funds and in total, we received three applications and one rebate was issued to Brookville Terrace. Uh, the CUE has expressed interest in leveraging a portion of the remaining green building funds to support potential fiscal year 24-25 projects. Also in fiscal year 23-24, the COE conducted a thorough review of the 2015 Climate Action Plan. So that Climate Action Plan will be 10 years old in 2025. 
During four consecutive regular commission meetings, the COE reviewed each of the six sectors of the Climate Action Plan and their associated measures. At this time, staff has compiled the COE's feedback and recommended updates for the new Climate Action Plan and budgeted 50,000 of the Green Building Funds for Climate Action Plan revisions in the proposed budget for, for fiscal year 24-25. Staff also plans to release a request for proposals for Climate Action Plan revisions in late summer of 2024. The COE is proposing four goals for fiscal year 24-25, with the priority being to support the update of the Climate Action Plan through conducting reviews at upcoming COE meetings. The remaining three goals include pursuing projects related to Soquel Creek and Noble Gulch maintenance and identify funding opportunities for those. Improving enforcement of regulations prohibiting the use of plastic straws and plastic pollution and investigating a white roof rebate program that incentivizes residents and business owners to reduce their energy usage. So as requested by City Council, two commissioners are here today to provide additional background information on these goals and why they were selected. So with that, I would like to introduce Chair Shepherdson and Commissioner Barrett's Hoff Law and invite them to come up to the podium. Welcome. Hi, Council members. I'm uh, Commissioner Shepherdson, or Chair, of the Commission on the Environment with Mario as well. Um, commissioners, Madam Vice Chair, um, or Mayor, excuse me. Um, my name is Michelle Beresoff Law, and I'm a commissioner on the COE. Um, and previously, I was the chair, um, and I've been on the commission, I think, for around four ish years. So um, I am a resident, obviously, of Capitola. Um, and my background, I am a senior project director at a Fishwise, which is a sustainable seafood consultancy based in uh, Midtown. Thanks. We're, we're happy to take any of your questions related to the goals that we've come up with. Um, a lot of these have been discussed at, at length. Um, the Climate Action Plan goals has put a lot of time into that. Um, projects related to the Soquel Creek and Noble Gulch uh, areas um, has kind of been, um, those areas have been closely watched for many years and um, Commission has kind of uh, tried to address um, low hanging fruits and how we can help the area and with a budget of zero dollars. We're talking about uh, commission members um, volunteering um, and seeing if we can get involved with some level of invasive plant removal. Um, and um, so that's what we're, where we're at right now with that. Um, regulations related to plastic straws and plastic pollution been working on for a while as well. Um, and then the white roof rebate program, um, that was just, that's been an idea that's been thrown around. Um, uh, the commission kind of, uh, maybe I'm leading this, this idea of like low hanging fruits, these things that are low cost that we can um, make an impact with, whether we're making a tangible impact or we're kind of leading in terms of technologies like white roofs, um, which, um, has been talked about is like helping deflect heat, helping with climate change, stuff like that. So, yeah, that's my role as the as the chair. And Michelle was instrumental in, um, prior to me becoming chair. I can just provide a bit um, adding to that context. Um, so, for why we prioritize the climate action plan for number one. Um, I just want to say it was also through expert guidance of city staff. Um, obviously, we were trying to find a real valuable use of time for all of our commissioners getting together. And so it was a really great idea. We really worked hard and reviewed other cities' climate adaptation. And um, I should say many of the new plans are going beyond just climate action plans. So for us, in going through this process, it really identified what I thought was a need for the city and an opportunity, um, not only to help address and prepare for future climate um, impacts, but also to provide a framework um, for the city to leverage to get additional grant funding through other means. Um, so those are a couple reasons why we have that down as number one. Um, however, in addition to these four, one of the main things we wanted to bring this to council was that we wanted to make sure that the commission helps support whatever 
priorities you as counselors have. And so that's one of the things, these were four items that resulted from the work we've done, but we wanted to really make sure we were engaging with the council members more. And so if there are specific priorities that you all think should be um, added to this list or brought to our attention, then we as the commissioners are really interested to hear them because at the end of the day, we wanna work as a team and really support improvements for Capitola. Um, so yeah, I'll just leave it at that unless you have any other specific questions for those four. Thank you. Council members, any questions? Question, is the group still around, Friends of Soquel Creek? I remember they were working on the projects of the evasive plans. Uh, so uh, I think you're referencing when group a group would go out and do that, do evasive plant removal? Yes. Um, it stopped happening. That was before my time too, as well. Um, that's I, I, I. There's the, the thought is kind of like trying to redo that again, trying to restart that a little bit with the commission. They were they were pretty active, and I I remember I joined them one day, but it's, I think there was death by COVID was one of the things that, mm. that happened. But so that's kind of yeah. So um, I think it would be probably worth looking again. Kind of, yeah, like a rekindling of that. Um, it's kind of the thought maybe. Any other questions? speak to that as questions for right now no questions okay um, any comments or questions from our audience shedding light and expanding the discussion of what you presented want to recommend people check out geoengineeringwatch.org with Dane Wigington about weather intervention, weather warfare operations and the patents for that. If you check into it, it's just fact after fact that's very disturbing about the unnatural weather. And then um, the environment also includes electro pollution which is quite uh, extensive and damaging and all the wireless facilities my understanding are, are being up to 5g i saw a film called 5g apocalypse the extinction event and these are the opening words just to give you a sense of the gravity it's important to understand what the 5G is doing and what they say it's doing. We're told on the International Electric and Electronic Engineers beam forming document that this technology cooks your eyes like eggs in World War II. We all need to understand these are military weapons. These are assault frequencies. If you garner nothing more than that, that's what you need to know. It's microwave radiation warfare. That's what this is, unquote, from the opening words of 5G apocalypse extinction event. Now, if I understood correctly, you just approved military equipment for the city of Capitol. So we're on item for the Commission on Environment. Right. This, this is an environmental issue. Did you, just to clarify for me, did you just pass that on the consent agenda? I item did. Eight? Mm -hmm. You did? Mm -hmm. Okay. I read through almost probably the identical thing for the county. So it involves, excuse me, it involves use of chemical weapons to be tested and tear gas, et cetera that is quite toxic to the environment. Um, this seems very inappropriate to militarize the seat, police, and sheriff. It is an environmental issue. That's why I'm bringing it up. Thank you. Okay, any other comments from the audience? No? Welcome back to the podium. <laughs> we're gonna, any, we're gonna, Entertain a motion or comments. I'll start on this side. Yeah, I just have some comments. First of all, I'd just like to thank you all for putting in the time and effort into this, you know, super important area. I also 
am a big advocate and appreciate that you added funding to the bylaws revision because I think that's such an important part of that. And I would just um, kind of add to that, you know, I think it is important to allocate funding to these types of things, and I would love to see more projects come forward to the city, whether it comes from city budget or if the city can help facilitate seeking grants. I think it is really important. Um, I do like the projects or initiatives that you're focusing on for um, this coming year. And I would just, one other thing that I was thinking about that may or may not be appropriate for your group is um, with the wharf renovation, I have been worried about the plastic or trash pollution that can come from that. And I was thinking, you know, there should be some way of catching that before it comes into the ocean. So I'm not sure if that's something you all would want to look into or not, but you know, that's definitely a priority is keeping trash out of the ocean. Thank you. Any other comments? just like to thank you for what you guys are doing. It's, it's very important for uh, us to have a commission on the environment. So thank you very much. Well, hats off to you guys. It's been awesome working with you, obviously. Um, I just want to point out to your point about the was it Friends of Soco Creek, is that what you said? Um, we're sort of looking into creating our own version of that within the COE. I'll keep the council up to date if anybody else wants to volunteer their boots and their time to pulling out some weeds. We might need some extra hands, um, but we're working closely um, with, I forget his name, Pete, or George, thank you, um, who has worked on um, Peary Park before with some removal. And so he... <laughs> I don't think he felt super confident in our abilities, but we'll work with him and we'll make it, we'll make it happen. He said we could use the city weed whacker. <laughs> he did. Oh. Well, he first asked if we'd ever used a weed whacker, but yeah. So um, things like that are happening, and we're kind of we're hoping that it can grow to be a bigger involvement of the public and and whatnot. But trying to sort of make the scope of it a little bit more understandable as to before we just jump six feet in and do it all by ourselves. Um, yeah, thank you guys for sitting up there with me. It's been great. Yeah, I'd just like to add, um, you know, I'd love to see more reports out from from this group, um, climate and all of this, the environment on the whole commission is just so important. And there's so many things that we need to keep, um, be aware of. You know, you bring up the wharf, which I, I agree with. Um, there's two things that I think can be can be worth adding to that. Um, I know in regards to the plastics, the straws, that the enforcement is report only, and it would be great. This is a non, you know, it doesn't cost much for us to have an annual review of our businesses or a plan, so I'd love to see that come back to council um, on, you know, rather than waiting for me because I'm the person that is calling the city that says, hey, I saw them using a plastic bag. You know, so I'd love to see an actual plan come out of that project. And then, um, as you know, our energy comes from Central Coast Community Energy. Um, they have actual policies that they've adopted, part of the CCE, the regional CCE program, um, that we could easily adopt and be in alignment with the clean energy that our city utilizes. So again, low-hanging fruit takes a phone call to cut and paste for the, the council to adopt. Um, so I'd love to see that come back. So um, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Erica. Thank you, Jason and Michelle, for coming this evening. Um, so tonight, um, the recommended action is to adopt the resolution um, adopting the amended Commission on the Environment Bylaws and to approve the list of Commission on the Environment Goals for 23 through 25. Do we have a motion? I'll move. We have a first. I'll second that. And a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? So this item passes. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Erica. Okay, so we're going to move on to item B. This is our parks use policy and resolution. I'm going to give Nikki a second to set up. And then, oh, she's ready. Yeah. Start. Okay. Welcome. The mic works. Yes. 
Yes. Now? Hello? Ah, okay. <laughs> All right. And from the top. Good evening, Mayor Council Members. Um, the item here before you is the park permit policy that we previously that talked about. Um, next slide, please. All right, so um, it's just a little bit of a background. It, currently in our city parks, um, if an individual wants to come and use the park for their own personal use, um, it is on a first come first serve basis. Uh, currently, Recreation manages the um, athletic field rentals and courts, and those reservations do have a permit process. Um, but there is no process currently in order for a small group to host gatherings such as birthday parties or memorials. Um, this has uh, caused a little bit of a conflict from time to time in our city parks as individuals have planned out their days with the expectation that they would have their birthday parties or gatherings and several individuals have had the same idea on the same day. So um, it's part of the reason that we're here talking about this is because we do end up having some of these conversations with those members of the public. Um, additionally, we end up having conversations around um, equipment that is brought into the parks for these exact gatherings that put the city at a liability risk. Uh, specifically, the equipment that we're going to talk about is portable barbecues, bounce houses, and um, temporary structures. And to be specific, these are the kind of structures that uh, you would rent to like have a part of your wedding. We're not talking about pop-ups. Pop-ups, whole other category. Um, so we, uh, the staff brought to city council, um, starting on March 14th, a ordinance that, um, repealed and replaced the capital and municipal code 12.40. Um, and if you'll go to the next slide, please. So this chapter that has since been approved, um, contained two kind of categories of information. The first part of the information was that um, it addressed some of the park regulations that um, had previously existed or, or we really need to have it exist. So in the park regulation category, it talked about like the general principles of um, being in the park intended uses, talking about no commercial activities, um, it also talked about some of the other ordinances that exist, such as the sound standard, and previously we had had open play hours at the bandstand. So these are the kind of things that you can find in this chapter that do not have anything to do with the um, reservation permit. Some of those are the prohibited activities. Um, there's lots of prohibited activities. It details out um, alcohol use and part of that list. Also in that list is um, barbecues. And specifically, it lists that the only place that barbecues are permitted is in Jade Street and Monterey Park. Um, it does say that there could be notice posted in um, specific parks. Now, the other aspect of the chapter addresses a reservation permit um, process. And so... It, I don't, it details out that there would be a permit that would be required in order to have exclusive use and then um, for equipment related to that exclusive use. And then council um, requested a policy um, for, to, to identify specific areas that would be available for permit. And so we are here to very specifically discuss the policy that that ordinance references. Um, the reservation permit also details um, the res or sorry, the ordinance regarding the reservation permit details out this other information that I won't go into detail at the moment. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, with the modified adopted code, um, we are here to discuss a parks policy, and um, part of that policy includes the identified reservable spaces. Um, the fun thing about all human beings is that we have the ability to see things from 
a lot of different perspectives. And as we try and go into planning out these kind of things for people, um, putting that kind of information in an ordinance uh, kind of restricts us in ways. And so having this policy really allows for the opportunity to make modifications to those spaces that are identified for use um, and, and due to the changing landscape, such as if, for example, one of our future parks, as we are currently planning, is going through a construction project um, that is currently listed on the reservable space. Um, so also, as part of the policy, um, or not as part of the policy, as part of the information that is included for the public, there's also a um, packet that an individual would receive that provides additional information, um, not only the reservable spaces, but kind of the terms and conditions of what you would expect for being in the park under that exclusive use. So if you'll go to the next slide, please. All right, and so specifically pertaining to the policy, um, there are um, some key parts of the information. The first is what we've identified is what spaces are available in each park and the capacities um, for those spaces. And included with the policy are images of the specific park and the spaces that would be available for use. I'll note for council that this resubmission has excluded Esplanade Park as requested. Um, the policy also details that um, th with a, uh, the city manager can make a temporary adjustment um, for up to one year without modifying the policy. Again, this is um, so that staff can have a construction project, make um, a post saying that the space is currently unavailable without having to bring back this policy to council for a resolution for any modification. Um, the policy also details out the permit requirements for bounce houses, barbecues, and temporary structures, as each one of those um, would have a permit associated with it, insurance requirements, and then also details out how bounce houses would not be allowed um, would be allowed in reservable spaces except for McGregor Park, and how, um, as we previously talked about, barbecues uh, would be allowed in Jade Street and Monterey Park. And then finally, the policy um, has a section that is all of the permit application requirements. The, uh, this information is like the terms and conditions, um, the how equipment insurance would be handled, um, and this type of information is information that within recreation, we regularly um, work with the public on a lot of these different types of things. We have, for example, the financial hardship. hardship. Um, we have a process for lots of different types of programs and a process for an individual to receive scholarship. And so pulling off of a lot of the systems and structures that already exist, it goes into further details within the information that we give to the public, but the policy details the expectations that that information would be included. Next slide, please. All right. And then, so as previously um, stated, the policy would include images that are like this. Um, detailing the park and detailing the specific locations that are available for use. If you can, next slide, please. Okay, next slide, please. And then um, as part of the other information, um, we have images that include uh, uh, what type of barbecues would be allowable um, because it does detail in the prohibited activities that charcoal barbecues would not be permitted in the parks and that it would be, the expectation is that it is a um, gas-fueled portable barbecue. All 
All right. Um, now, separate from the policy, in um, the information that would go out to the public, uh, there are proposed fees that council, um, I staff welcomes any additional feedback on these proposed fees. Um, the recommendation for this evening is to not only approve the policy, but to direct staff to come back with the fees for um, the fee schedule. And so this right here is the proposed fees um, that are kind of built into the literature right now. And then as we move on, you'll see these. Um, but again, this is up for discussion. Uh, one thing that I will note is that um, it has been recommended to us that having a fee um, kind of legitimizes the agreement between the individual and the city. And so even having a small fee um, is an important aspect of that agreement. But as previously said, it is up to council if there is modifications to this. Next slide, please. All right, so I'm going to walk you through a little bit of um, what a user process would be like if they were to go to get um, a reservation for a park space. And so I'll write what you're looking at is um, slides that are images from the um, our registration system. It's called Civic Rec. And I'll just note for council that we have the ability to build something without making it live to the public. So as you see this, you're going to see the exact process, but nobody from the public could go on right now and access this. And even though there are fees listed here, they're the proposed fees, but they're not set. We can go back and change them. Um, so an individual would go in through the reservation process. They would select their date, and they would choose the hours that they would like to reserve the space, if you'll Go to the next slide, please. And then the cart would populate that, um, what would be the cost, and the image is in um, the way, but it would populate the total cost for the rental of the space. And then the next slide, please. And then as you progress through the registration system, uh, this it would give the individual prompts. They would get to choose if they would like to also request a bounce house permit um, or if they would like to request a temporary restructure. And in this example before you, um, this pretend person has selected every single one of them. Next slide, please. And then um, as they progress through the uh, process, they would sign the waivers. Um, which is very similar information as to what you would find as part of the packet, the reservation packet that was included in the agenda packet. Next slide, please. And then they would move on to a payment section. Um, once they would proceed past this, they would receive an email, and the email would give them um, additional information about um, insurance regarding any of the equipment that they are interested in having as part of their reservation. Next slide, please. And then staff would be reaching out to them regarding that insurance information. Um, so Recreation currently works with um, providing insurance to individuals for a number of different things. Most commonly is if an individual is doing a um, rental at the community center. And this system is, um, two of the options have already been, have already existed. And so the first one is, is that a participant can reach out to their own homeowner's insurance or personal liability and ask for an event extension. Um, this is typically around a $50 expense estimate if that's the pathway that they would choose. If they do not have either of those options, the city has worked with um, Hub International, and Hub uh, and the Recreation works with Hub in order to help process their application. The city also uses Hub International for some of our other like um, additional in uh, insurance for our events, such as our food truck events. Um, but for the purpose of someone doing something small, that range, depending upon what the type of event that they are doing, the range would uh, be from about $45 to $200. Uh, 
Um, and then a third option regarding the bounce houses, because we haven't done these before, um, but our neighboring agencies use this process where the city would set up a um, additional insured certificate, have that on file with specific vendors, and then we provide a list of vendors uh, to the individuals doing the reservations. In the system, the insurance is no additional cost um, for the bounce house, but the participant um, would pay for the vendor service. Uh, we are not allowed to require them to use our specific vendors. It's an option, an option of convenience because we would already have the insurance on file. Uh, an individual could choose to go with a party that isn't on our list, and they would still have insurance um, options from the exact same list here, minus the third one. Next slide, please. And then, so this is a sample of what that looks like. This is um, the already existing information that we would provide individuals for the community center, but then the bounce house vendors has been um, added here. These aren't real vendors, this is a sample. Thank you. Next slide. All right, so as previously stated, um, the action tonight does not have any fiscal impact, um, but the current fee schedule does not include any of the proposed permit fees. Um, and it, when directed, staff will return with an amendment to adopt the fee schedule to reflect the proposed park fees. Next slide, please. And so the recommended action for tonight is to adopt a resolution adopting the city park reservation use policy and direct staff to return to city council with amendments to the fee schedule to reflect the proposed park fees. And with that, I am available for questions. Any questions? No questions, thank you. Um, I have four questions so far. So, um, or actually, sorry, more than that. Well, okay, hold on. <laughs> it's a lot, okay. Um, <laughs> okay, first, this is a minor question, but the it says an individual with a reservation will receive the um, reservable park area packet. Is this information included in the packet also gonna be easily available online? Or is this something like you have to, yes. Yes, yeah. So we um, currently, in, in any packets that would go through the Civic Rec system, so like I explained, you would go through your reservation, that packet would be attached to the email as a receipt, and so they would automatically get it, um, but we duplicate uh, all of that kind of information as well. So in our very, in similar programs where they receive packets for with the receipt, it is also usually the majority of it is the language that is within the website page that explains the system. Um, okay, and then I have some questions about the uh, barbecues. What is the um, reasoning for only allowing barbecues at Jade Street and Monterey Park? Um, we went with that because they were just the most populated parks, um, but they're, they could just as easily be added to other parks. Okay, so I guess it's like, why not just have them at all parks? It seems like you're like adding a rule onto it by restricting the amount of parks that barbecues can be held at. So it's like, is there any reason to do that? Um, so in, in preparation for this meeting, I did reach out to um, our central fire district in order to just kind of do a little bit of evaluation as to like, is there a re is there any particular reason why we why we should not have it, um, considering uh, the location of the parks? And in general, they felt that the accessibility to those parks would be um, fine. That in some cases, barbecues in backyards would be harder in the city compared to some of those parks. Um, just interrupt. When you yeah. say those parks, you mean all of the parks, not just the two in question, right? I am specifically referring to the ones that we're talking about for the, the reservation. So, um, so only Jade and Monterey. Well, no, because there is Noble Gulch and McGregor that yeah, is okay. also included in that list. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the fire district said that there was not any increased risk from allowing barbecues at those parks as well. 
I don't know if they I'm would. Hearing. I don't know if they would choose that specific language, but they didn't feel that there was any particular reason due to access that we should prohibit them. Okay, um, and that is kind of leads me to my next question: is about uh, charcoal barbecues versus gas. Did you happen to bring up that question with them? And is that is our restriction on charcoal barbecues consistent with the rest of the county? Well, so. The rest of the county, if you were to go to a lot of other parks in the county, they have developed um, barbecue park barbecues, right? There's these cast iron planted into the ground um, charcoal barbecues, and they establish a safe space. They do the parks maintenance does clearing around them in order to establish a safe space for those charcoal barbecues. Currently in Capitola, we do not have any of that infrastructure. And so the portable gas barbecue is the next safest opportunity because in order to remove charcoal from a space, there's a lot of safety considerations that need to be taken into account. Um, and so in my conversation with a representative from Central, they definitely um, we're pleased that we were discussing gas-powered um, barbecues because of the ability to shut the fuel off and be able to move that device with a less risk. And did you um, did they mention? Do they have issues with charcoal barbecues if they are in like a more permanent facility, or is, are they more concerned because it's like movable and people need to get rid of their charcoal before they pack up and into the car? Yeah, I, I think the issue is really more of how do you then dispose of the charcoals? Where does that go? Um, and whether or not the infrastructure is in place in order to have have that um, medium of fire. I'm not sure mm -hmm. what I would call that. Yeah, great. So it sounds like they don't necessarily have any issues with in more of the park locations, but they would still kind of feel a little bit of an increased risk due to charcoal at this point without infrastructure being implemented. I, um, I would agree with that. I think that it's really more about the infrastructure of, of that particular risk material. Okay, and then I have one more question about barbecues. Um, what is the justification, and, and if I'm interpreting this correctly, there's a $10 additional fee for having a barbecue. So what is the justification of that, if my understanding is correct? Um, to have the have the permit fee? Is that what yeah. you're asking? Yeah, so it's, yeah. I thought that it was an additional $10 on top of the reservation fee if you want to have a barbecue. So, like, yeah, what's the reasoning behind that? Yeah, you're correct. Again, it's because um, having a permit fee um, is a way of really legitimizing the agreement between the participant and the city. It, it's a pretty standard process for when you do fees um, in order to kind of account for the staff cost relationship to that, but also it legitimizes the agreement that there is a recognition that this is a piece of equipment that um, does impose risk to the city and it engages them in the opportunity to have the insurance conversations um, with the through the permit process okay so and that's actually a good segue into my last question is the insurance requirement is that just for the barbecues and the bounce houses or is that for everybody making a reservation um as of right now it is specific to the equipment that um they would be requesting for a permit because of the risk associated with that equipment so just for barbecues and bounce houses, is that correct? And temporary structures. Oh, and temporary structures. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. And and also just to be clear, the bounce houses, while it is probably the most common uh, request that we will get, it's actually bounce houses and powered equipment, just for clarity. So if someone were to bring in some other type of powered equipment, <laughs> okay, yeah, but other powered equipment, that would also fall under there. It's just... Most people don't bring generators to their parties unless they're hooking it up to a bounce house. Is that um, would like amplified music be included in powered equipment or is not? That not in that at way. all. Anyone no, that? not for that purpose. And there's also an amplified sound thing. That's a whole separate. We're not going to got gonna it. So the additional fee is kind of to make up for an increased level of liability that the city has, even though we're requiring insurance. Correct. So there is an increased level of liability, even though we are requiring them to have insurance. Is that correct? 
I for the city. I've, I've. Yeah, I mean, we get indemnification and people have homeowners insurance, but you know, if something really bad happens, a homeowner's million dollar policy is not going to cover the city and all of eventuality. Got it. Okay, that's the last of my questions. Thank you. Any other questions? I have a couple quick questions. Enforcement. I'm assuming it's going to be our CSOs, but not not necessarily the police officers that'll do the enforcement. Um, or is it? Your staff. That's it. Well, okay. So what would happen is is that if someone were to bring that complaint um, to somebody at the community center, then our staff would go out and they would talk to them and they would provide the education regarding um, whatever the activity is. We do that regularly for things that are not related to tonight's item. Um, and in the event that the, the education isn't um, helpful or welcome, um, then our next step would be to either decide if this is a non-emergency and call the non-emergency for support, which sometimes is a CSO, sometimes it's a patrol, um, uh, or to go ahead and call for emergency support. So we, there's kind of a hierarchy that we move through in regards to any of anything that any activity that's in our park. And, and hopefully we would be well versed on the policy for an officer to show up or a CSO or your staff so that they know the policy and the regulations. That would be the intent. Yeah. And then the last question I have is, are the fees offsetting any of the costs for cleaning up the parks? or the extra manpower that, that maintenance is going to have to take care of? Well, I, so considering that this is a new process, I'm, I, I would not have expected it to have been part of the fee study that has, has just taken place. Um, so I can't accurately answer that question, but definitely the intent um, of the permit fees to recoup some of the staff costs that are um, in relationship to issuing the permit. I think that would be something important to look into because a lot of times there'll be an event on Saturday, all the garbage cans get filled, Sunday comes around, and if we don't have somebody there to take care of them, it's, it's problematic. Yeah. That's all. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I did have a quick question. Um, these time frames of reservations, they'll just, they'll mimic the park's hours that are already implemented and so I'm assuming sorry I just just because I, I haven't been on the <clears throat> website or anything but that'll all be blocked out on the website it'll be very clear that you know 6 p.m. or at sundown or whatever is when they're supposed to be off the premise and all yeah that. okay yeah it um when we build the civic rec system, we build the reserve like the available times within. So, for example, if you were to try and go and reserve a room at the community center right now, it would be fixed to the hours of operation relationship to that. Okay. And then in terms of the insurance coverage that they themselves would purchase, is that then something that they will either like upload onto the site so that we have it on hand? Is that? Unfortunately, you can't upload them to the site. It okay. is a communication between staff. And so it, recreation staff currently for community center rentals, will we will reach out to the individual that has that rental in order to make sure that they have completed their insurance requirement and provide any assistance if they are confused as to what the steps are. And then, I'm sorry, this may be a dumb question, but throughout these hours that the parks are available to be reserved, is there always a staff member of rec on duty? Um, not during the weekends. Okay. But during the weekdays, we have recreation staff that are on right. from about 8 until 9. And weekends would then be the most probable time for reservations is what I'm assuming. Um, so have we thought about how to possibly rearrange the schedule or like figure out, uh, obviously we'll be charging fees. I don't think that they would cover an employee at that point, but um, is there a way maybe 
sorry, this just came to my head right now, but like if we can revisit this after we've done like three, four months of these reservations, I, I don't want our PD to take the brunt of this every weekend or our, or our community officers. If there's a touch person that they've been involved with over email throughout the week and then come Saturday, Sunday, there's nobody there. So we, we do have, um, it's not like, all the hours, but we do have staff that are occasionally on at the community center. Mm -hmm. um, that being said, we're looking at having nobody at the community center for you know a year here. But right. um, I will go ahead and tell you that I imagine if you were to engage PD in conversation about this, they would probably tell you that they're already in our parks pretty regularly for the typical weekend activity. Um, what would add to this is that having a reservation um, having a, a use a reservation system that is in place allows us to be able to provide to PD, hey, just a heads up, we've got these reservations and these parties that are planned. Um, and it enhances the internal staff communication so that the activities that are happening on the weekend is more of a transparent thing. So PD in turn would have access to the information throughout the weekend. If, if they wanted it, we would be happy to provide it. Have we had that conversation yet? No, That's but fine. we have. <laughs> we're still Sorry, I, th these questions are just coming as we're talking. So I don't. I'm not trying to like fire at you. I'm just yeah. like <laughs> they're all coming up right now. I, I, it's actually a, a great idea. Okay. And to allay your fears, maybe a little bit. You know, right now the planning department issues a lot of permits, and they're not working necessarily on weekends. So, for example, like tree removal permits, like right. they've worked out processes so that PD will know. Okay, yes, somebody has a permit. You know, so that's something that we haven't worked out necessarily the exact details of whether it's an internal database sharing or we give somebody a physical permit or we give them a digital permit. But that's something that we're going to need to do for sure. Okay. Uh, well, I guess maybe my ask would be that maybe. If the council agrees, if if we could maybe revisit this, like kind of how we're doing the whole wharf situation, like sort of have this pilot program launch. I, I think we're all really supportive of it. I don't mean to speak for everybody, but I think to sort of revisit it and just see where PD stands, where Parks and Rec stand, where Public Works stands, it it is all, it's going to affect everybody. So I just want to make sure everybody's feeling heard and, and protected by the steps that we're taking to progress, obviously, I think is great. But I just don't know if that might be something we could ask for, not to not pass this, but to sort Six of... Six-month review? Yeah, something, something like that. Okay, um, so we're still at questions. So let's just pause unless there's any more questions, and then we'll come back to talk about this a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, I have a couple of questions for Nikki. Um, you know, so how I understand this is to create process. This isn't for making money, um, this whole thing. And it's sounding like it's just adding up. <clears throat> um, and so two of my questions is just about the scholarship piece of it. Um, where would that, A, how much paperwork is it? And then B, is it like on the front page, like you can access the scholarship Tell me a little bit more about how you can access so this doesn't cost anything. Um, so currently what would happen is, is that there is a um, financial hardship application. Um, depending upon the type of program, depends on how, um, how in-depth that application is, right? So for some of our programs, like our after-school program, for example, it's a little, little more information. Um, in in this regards, it could it would be just a, a simple questionnaire, and then it, it had, there's a review process. And so we create it, not well, the universal hub thing website. That was in the presentation. We have to go to universal hub to get for insurance. For so maybe that's more of my question. How do you how does so, someone who can't afford two hundred dollars to rent a space for their their stuff they there's an insurance coverage, and then there's something else to get the fees covered. Mm -hmm. So um, we, it actually never occurred to me to include insurance as part of that. To um, I was looking at it from just the permit fee. Yeah. Um, but if we did want to include insurance, then the hub international process would be assuming that it was 
something that wasn't a bounce house. If they wanted equipment that was a, a barbecue or a temporary structure, the bounce house would be easy because that is a, a different system. Um, so the Hub International Insurance would be the only option, that, but we, like I said, regularly work with them, um, and it depends on the kind of event as the actual cost, and so that could be accounted for in the overall cost through the application. So on the portal, maybe we can create like an easy cheat sheet of boom, 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 this is what you do to fill it out and kind of simplify that process for somebody? Yeah, so what what happens right now in Civic Rec is that if an individual is interested in applying for um, scholarship, then they register through the system and they choose a, I'm interested, they do a little, I'm interested in scholarship checkbox. Mm -hmm. And then they choose, a, and that checkbox tells them to choose pay later. And then they choose the pay later option um, which gives them the opportunity to hold their reservation or their registration, go through the scholarship application process, be reviewed, approved, and then a recreation staff applies the funds to their account. And then depending upon if they've received a percentage of scholarship, they either are paid in full because of the scholarship allocation or they go, or we ask them to go back and um, pay any remaining that wasn't covered so by that would scholarship. Be the process for this essentially. Exactly. Um, and then there's been multiple concerns just about cleanup and just like transparency of this is my spot. Are there so tell me where we could have kind of the the outline? Would that live in our policy or in the resolution on really clear standards of this is who you're going to reach out to? Um, you know. Yes, there will be a sign that says reserve. Like, where would that be? Where could that language live so that it's just really clear? Because I, we're just hearing kind of all those little, yeah, you know, those nuances that are just important too. Yeah. So definitely, my recommendation would be that that kind of information is included in the literature that an individual gets with their receipt, which I've been referring to as the reservation packet. The reservation packet gives us the opportunity to respond to the ever-changing landscape um, that is our parks and people. Um, if we were to put it in the policy, then any necessary changes that we needed to make in response to these kind of issues would have to come back to council and have a resolution in order to change the policy. Right. And so my last question is just in general for staff and for PD, just kind of hearing, knowing that there is no staff working from Parks and Rec over the weekend, this is where we're going to see the bulk of the reservations come through. Does staff feel comfortable taking this offline and figuring it out, even if we pass this, and or does it need to come back under this packet thing and resolution and such? Yeah, so what this gives us the opportunity to do is have a much stronger internal communication than what we currently have. Um, there, We already have a practice in place for when we hold events and, and let and engage public works and say, hey, we're going to be doing this thing. Um, and it allows public works to have weekend staff as being part of that plan. Um, we've used them in the past for various little one-offs. You may remember um, we did a pandemic art show and had that level of communication with public works. So this will give us the opportunity to say that we've got a 74-person birthday party in Monterey Park and that space is reserved and all this equipment. We just want to let the weekend staff know that that's happening. Okay. Um Thank you. Any, those are all my questions. Any other questions before we take it out to the public? I have one last question. Please. Um, is the website bilingual? Um, no, it is not bilingual. Is there a cost associated with that? There is, yeah. So Civic Rec does have a uh, bilingual plugin of some sort. I could not tell you what the cost is, um, but any, otherwise, any materials that um, we publish would all be PDFs, forms that have the opportunity to be bilingual. But the website itself does not is not bilingual. Is there a way to come back with that information about cost uh, regarding Civic Rack? Yeah, I I think so. I, I if at a minimum, definitely 
Friday update. Um, if I can just interject, Mayor and Councilor, Vice Mayor and Council, excuse me. As you'll remember, as a part of the proposed budget for fiscal year 24-25, the city manager's office is proposing translation services as a part of that budget. And so this is something that would be a part of kind of the follow through on that proposed line item as we would be investigating the costs associated with providing the translation services for both our website and the civic rec platform. Okay, and so that's like a, a digital form of I'm sorry, a digital right. form of <laughs> digital, like the website itself, not like somebody that's available to. Right? So in terms of translation services to in part, like if someone was to call the city and ask a question of a staff member in another language, we have certain staff members who um, are translator certified for things like Spanish. Um, however, the website and the civic rec module, like the systems, do have translation services. We don't currently have those services in our contract. However, with the addition of that translation services line item in the budget that's proposed for next fiscal year, we would have the opportunity to review the costs and add those services to our contracts. Okay, thank you for remembering that. Julia, am I hearing correctly that you are looking at it or it's gonna happen with this agenda item or with that line item? Is it guaranteed that it's gonna happen or is it coming back to us? There are certain translation services that the city will be required to complete. For example, emergency um, communications, California law will soon require cities to translate those. So we have to prioritize what is required of us under law, but we will be investigating the cost to see how much we could maximize with the funding allocated. Uh, Council Member Morgan, am I hearing that you wanna see the Civic Plus platform bilingual tr or translation come back to us so we can see if there's a cost, what the cost associated and to bring that back um, in addition to the other normal stuff. Is that what I'm hearing you say? Yeah. Okay. So did you, does that make sense that we'd like to see that come back? Um, I, I honestly don't know enough about the technology to know if it actually makes sense. I'm looking at Nikki, are you aware of kind of the civic rec system? Is that, is that a service that is feasible? Yeah. So there, it, it is a matter of cost okay. and how it would adjust our contract. So it's a it's a plug-in of some Perfect. sort. I, I I think that a Friday update I, of like this is what it would cost to add that plug-in um, would would. And then we can answer. decide whether to agendize it or not. And you can hear from a council member to agendize it or not. Okay. Yeah. Um, comments from the community. Did you ask for public comment? Yeah. Okay. It's your turn now. Okay. Please. Thank you. Um, a lot of questions. So, um, mainly, I, is this, you asked the question, is this a process? It's a process for making money for the city. Is that the reason for this? No. Okay. So, um, it seems like, uh, and does it, just to clarify, does it just pertain? to bounce houses, barbecues, and power equipment and vendors, but it doesn't apply, say, oh, I want to meet you at the park. Let's have a little picnic with friends. You don't need a permit for that. Is that correct? I'm not going to answer all your questions, but I'll briefly answer the question. You're right that it, you can go hang out as much as you want at the park. Yes, you're fine to go hang out. Fine with that. And then the other question is, it, because I heard you talk about scholarship for fees, it seems to me where some people would have gone to the park who don't have much money, if they want to do barbecues or whatever, they have to pay a fee, which might exclude some people who are low income. That's kind of a, a worry that I have. So those, those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, any other one? Anyone else? Anybody else? No. Okay. No? All right. We're going to come back to council. Um, so the item tonight is to adopt a resolution adopting a city park reservation permit use policy and direct staff to return to the city council with amendments to the fee schedule to reflect proposed park space reservation fees, please. 
I would just like to um, maybe add a couple things that we can clarify. One is when there's no um, parks and recs person on duty that they have somebody they can contact, probably CSO, make sure that we have some type of training for them so they uh, have knowledge of the policy. That's what I would just like to see happen so that we can you know, make sure we take care of everybody. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. And I think I totally understand what you're saying, that it's going to create a little bit more communication between our different departments. But I think maybe as a council, just being able to like visualize how that's going to go down a little bit better would be helpful for us to. So even when people ask us like, hey, I saw so and so had the bounce house, like, how do you do that? And who's your point person and all that? I think it would just be helpful for us to kind of streamline that too and not have everything be on just staff all the time. Um, so is this is technically coming back to us just in the fee schedule or? Okay. So you're going to return to city council with the amendments to the fee schedule to reflect the proposed parks. Um, so that would be your direction. Uh, that's how I'm reading it. Well, the but so it would be to tonight adopt a resolution adopting the park policy and then provide staff direction for the fee schedule assuming that the you don't have any changes to the proposed fees yeah no questions i was just talking to jamie about the uh, timing okay so as written i'm just going to assume that's what you're looking for nikki um, Councilmember Peterson. I would like to propose that we remove the restriction on where which parks barbecues are allowed. Not to make a change in the type of barbecue allowed at this time, but I would also like to say <clears throat> when we bring this back for assessment um, in six months or whatever it may be, it would be interesting to see if there is a lot of barbecue usage and then I think at that point we can start a longer term conversation of whether it makes sense to install charcoal bins or some sort of permanent barbecues if it is a heavily used you know aspect of our park um, and then just one more comment is that I believe we're doing some type of digitization of forms right in this coming year and it sounds like the financial hardship application is a separate form in addition to the reservation form and anything we can do to streamline these processes if we could combine it you know you, you click yes i'm interested and it opens up more questions and the ability to upload files for verification i think that would be really helpful for people just to streamline the process so if i can um clarify when we take in a scholarship application, it is a third party nonprofit that is reviewing that for financial approval. The city does not um, do our own review and approval of financial hardship for the receiving of benefit of for the benefactory of that. So um, while we could take that information, we could probably build a form into Civic Rec. We would need to be able to send that information to that third party. And so I, we can definitely look into it, um, but it's not as, it's a little few more steps than um, like a Civic Rec approval. Is the nonprofit um, actually the one providing the funding or is that? No, so the funding, scholarship funding comes from several sources. So internally or? Um, some, some of them are externally. They're, they're, we have nonprofits that donate mm -hmm. funds. We have the ECYP fund that council allocates. The school district provides funds. There's a, we have varied sources. Okay. In clarification on your suggestion, you're suggesting the four parks that we identified tonight we allow barbecue permits at and then I would suggest that if we were going to do a review that we do it in one year just to give us a chance to kind of get the program off the ground see how it goes through a season um, if that's okay I don't know if you know people are talking about a shorter review I just don't know if in three months we would have necessarily learned exactly how the program something closer to six months I just think a year 
if if there's a specific department that is shouldering this whole thing and it goes on for a year and it's not working out, like, and we don't hear about it until a year from now. Like. If, it, if it's not working out, I care about it sooner than that. <laughs> right. Yeah. So the, the question is just sort of the mandated review with council. If it's not working out, we will absolutely bring it back to you to modify the program. Well, I don't mean it that black and white. Like, I'm literally interested in like the inner workings of this clearly, you know, so I, and I don't know, I'm not trying to speak for PD at all or anybody else within any other departments, but because it sounds like so many of us are going to be involved in it. I'm a little bit interested in a larger conversation than what's been had in the last two meetings personally. Uh, if Councilman Peterson can uh, clarify, did you say you want them to allow Coal burning? No, no, okay. just gas burning at Thank this you. time. At but I would be interested in if there's a large demand for barbecues in general. I would say we should bring it back and you know assess whether or not we want to invest in something that would make it safe for coal. Okay, Nikki, great job. This is a lot, and yeah. it you know it's kind of those things that we know everything. It's personal because we know. With the, but how we're going to utilize it or how our family or our friends are going to utilize it. So it's just something where we know about. So I appreciate you being open to the conversation. I think you did a great job. Um, I think what was really clear that I was hearing is that it's really important to make the accessibility, um, the scholarships or whatever it may be, easy. And I'm happy that uh, Council Member Morgan brought forward the bilingual aspect, like it, how in the world, you know, how is that something that we're not doing anyways on the Civic Plus thing platform? So um, thank you and thanks for hearing us out. At this point, I'm looking for a, um, a motion. I'll move to make a motion that uh, take the recommendation of staff. Second. Okay, we have a first and a second and staff, you have all the the notes and stuff, I don't, I think we need to make that amendment to the, um, with yeah. your barbecue bits. So I need to make, I need to amend it, friendly amendment um, to allow barbecues at all of the um, parks that we're talking about tonight. Do you accept Council Member Clark? Okay, so we have a first and a second. Are we happy with that? Everyone good? Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, this item passes. We're going to move on to item 8C. This is, thank you, Nikki. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Welcome. We're um, 8C Community Center Renovation Project. This is Ms. Khan's item. Good evening, Mayor and Council members. Um, some exciting progress in the community center project here, and we are here to talk about a contract for construction management services. Uh, next slide, please. So just a little bit of background on this project. Um, the city in November of 2022 approved a long-term use agreement with the SoCal Union Elementary School District uh, for improvements on the Jade Street property, uh, inclusive of the community center for infrastructure and ancillary improvements to be completed within four years of the uh, signed agreement. Next slide, please. Um, so since that time, staff has been diligently working on a design and a construction uh, budget for this project. In February, the council approved a design agreement with Boone Low Ratcliffe Architects, and we presented a conceptual design where you all uh, authorized us to move forward with our construction documents. Also last summer, we received confirmation that we are getting a hundred, sorry, a million dollar contribution through the California Natural Resources Agency sponsored by um, State's Assemblywoman, uh, Don Addis. Um, we are approaching quickly, summer 2024. We expect a confirmation of a um, community development block grant in the amount of $3.2 in construction dollars for this project, uh, which requires us to bid this project later this summer. We are currently lining all of our ducks up in a row to do so. We have our building permit in. We have all of our permits with other regulatory agents in, so we are very confident we're going to be able to move forward and bid that out. We'll be back to council with those final plans prior to uh, bidding out that project. 
and with a fall construction date. So again, Nikki and everybody moved out around October and having about a year long construction period for this project. Next slide. Um, so with that, we will be requiring a project management consultant. So we put out a RFP for a construction management firm for them to do on-site supervision. So this is gonna be the day-to-day -day person who's going to oversee this project in a design build, bid build project, which is most of the projects that we do here in the city. We, the city as the owner, separately contract with the architect, uh, bid a project out to a general con contractor who controls all the subs. And then since we have limited staff here, we uh, hire construction managers. We had one for the library um, to do that on-site supervision, do value engineering if needed, if the bids come in high, um, to do project and construction management, kind of do quality review, review all of the invoices. And that's gonna be particularly important for this project since we have a lot of funding sources. Next slide. Um, so again, we put out a request for proposals. We had a four week response period, which is typical for these kind of contracts. We received five proposals and did interviews with the top three uh, proposers in early May with public works and recreation staff. Um, from that, the coming group came out as the uh, uh, recommended group for this project. They have ex a lot of similar projects, uh, most recently community center renovations in Mountain View and Los Altos. Um, they also work locally extensively with UCSC and also in Scotts Valley. And they are a very reputable and skilled team and also just really nice people. Next slide. Um, so here's a summary of our known project costs so far. The city's put in about $1.8 million towards the design and construction of this project. Uh, the million dollars mentioned from the California Natural Resources Agency, the CDBG grant, and recently we were informed that we're going to be awarded an AMBAG grant, which is specifically for the uh, electric vehicle chargers required for that project. Um, we have um, contracts out for conceptual and final design. Um, the, today we're talking about the construction management contract and those soft costs here add up to about 14% of this project, which is actually pretty much on the low side for uh, this type of project. So well within the normal range for a uh, complete renovation project of a public building. Next slide. Um, so with that, the recommended action is on the board. Somewhere I lost a slide, but uh, also in there is a, a recommendation to, to add $37,000 of contract value to the project design team and getting together CDBG grant. We went through a lot of iterations to get exactly the way they wanted it formatted and all of the documents we needed to be eligible for that grant. So some extra costs were incurred there. So with that and the Cummings Group Agreement, uh, happy to answer any questions you may have. Any questions? Questions? Oh my goodness, that is a lot of projects we have going on. Jessica, comments from our audience or questions? Seeing none, let's bring this back to council for further deliberation. Any votes? I will move the recommended action, uh, parts one and two. Any first? I'll second that. You may second. I would just comment that if Assemblywoman Addis is watching our very exciting meeting this evening. I just want to say thank you um, for the support of this project. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Seeing none, this item passes. We're going to go ahead and recess to back into closed session and then come back for final adjournment. Um, thank you to everyone that's um, joined us this evening. We will see you back on May 30th at 6 p.m. for our next council meeting. Hello everyone, welcome back. Um, we are returning from closed session. Do we have any reportable action? Good evening, and I reported out earlier inadvertently, even though the closed session was not completed, we just completed the closed session and no reportable action was taken. Thank you. Okay, so that means we'll move to item nine, adjournment. Thank you again to everyone who is here tonight and to staff. We will return on May 30th at 6 p.m. This meeting is adjourned.